Welcome back to The Erica Show. I'm Erica from Crypto Soul, and in The Erica Show, I meet with astonishing founders and builders in the crypto space. And today, I'm incredibly thankful and honored to welcome today's guest, who is Elie Bensasson, co-founder and president of Starkware. Hi, Elie. Hi. Hi, Erica. Thanks for having me on the show. Yes, great to have you. And could you, I, I see that you're wearing the Starkware t-shirt, but, you know, could you please introduce yeah. yourself and uh, share with us how you got into the crypto rabbit hole? Okay, so uh, um, my name is Eddie Ben Sasson. I'm um, co-founder and president at Starkware, which is an Israeli startup that uh, we co-founded about three years ago. I, you know, swallowed the crypto red pill in May 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing research at the time. I was a professor at uh, Technion, Israel mm -hmm. Institute of Technology, and I was working on uh, moon math uh, related to uh, this thing called zero knowledge proofs. And um, I went to present my work at the Bitcoin uh, conference in San Jose in May 2013. And Wow, that was an amazing experience, the most electrifying uh, conference I ever attended. Mm -hmm. And there I had this eureka moment that only later I realized that that's what happened. But what happened was that um, I understood that the technology I was interested in for my academic research is actually something that is you know, perfectly aligned with what um, blockchains need. And uh, so that was like a, a match made in heaven. And ever since then, I've sort of shifted into blockchains and crypto. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's that eureka moment, but it was very early back in 2013. Wow, that's, that must have been an amazing time. Um, and uh, since then, yes. you've been building, 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 huh? <laughs> yeah, so initially uh, with... Uh, uh, a bunch of academic peers, uh, we published a paper titled Zero Cash that mm -hmm. then led to us, uh, all of us, uh, seven scientists becoming founding scientists of the Zcash cryptocurrency. That was around 2015. And uh, three years later, um, you know, new technology uh, matured. And then I partnered with three other co-founders and um, uh, we uh, co-founded uh, Starkware, which is uh, the present gig I'm involved in. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, uh, even though I'm not a uh, developer, but still, when I hear, I, I hear the critical concepts, like, as you just said, you, you mentioned Stark and Zero Cash Protocol, Zcash, and the founding, you're the founding uh, scientist of that. So I'm just really in awe of like what trajectory that you have, you know, come across and you have built um, until now. And you know, what got you interested in the big, like in the first place in this technology? And you know, they're huge concepts, right? <laughs> but why are privacy and scalability important to you? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, my path, I guess like many people in crypto or like life in general, was a very um, winding path. I sort of ended up here. I had no idea I'd end up here. Um, I started my career, uh, you know, I went to college. Uh, I studied computer science. I really liked it. I liked it so much that I continued to do uh, an academic uh, you know, a PhD, it was very theoretical, a lot of math involved. And I researched these um, very mathy objects uh, that were purely theoretical. And I was very happy with that. And I never thought that, um, you know, I was very happy and content doing this math and, you know, that was fine. And around uh, 2008, I, I got this um, pretty sizable grant from the European research community and I thought that it might be good to use it to fund some reduction to practice of some of the stuff that I was researching. Again, with no real you know, purpose other than you know, there's funding and why not put it to good use. Mm -hmm. And um, then around 2013, it became uh, relevant to blockchains. And um, so, so the way I got into blockchains came from academia in very abstract math. And the questions 
that attracted me, that got me into this, were questions around, you know, improving the theoretical performance of uh, zero knowledge proof systems and proofs of computational integrity. So first I did the math, then I did a little bit of uh, math to, um, you know, academic proof of concept mm -hmm. code, and then to uh, entrepreneurship from there. Mm. So it's a more practical use. You're now you're putting it to practical use cases, which is uh, yes. the ultimate result of uh, right now you're doing it with Starkware, right? And yes. you know, for you, you're trying to basically tackle both privacy and scalability, which is like huge concepts surrounding the you know blockchain space out there. And it's I mean the space itself is so nascent, and there's always room for growth. And you know, uh, I I was very uh, I'm very uh, in awe, like how you founded Stark Starkware from like when you were a founding scientist at Zcash. How did that like? Uh, how did you make the transition? And you know, how did you make uh, uh, find your co-founder? Uh, okay, so, um, um, so so Zcash was an application of you know the math that we were involved to privacy. So there are two things, two main things that cryptographic proofs can deliver. One of them is privacy through zero knowledge proofs. And that's what, uh, you know, we demonstrated in the zero cash um, academic paper. And this is what Zcash delivers. And then the other aspect that personally, I was always more attracted to it because I found it far more mysterious and hard to obtain is this notion of scalability, which means that um, basically you can prove that you executed a computation correctly um, and the proof of this correctness can be exponentially smaller than the amount of time it took you to do the computation and anyone can verify so it's like a very short signature for um, a very long computation and um, you know this was so at the time I was involved in Zcash and you know Zcash had and still has its hands full with uh, delivering privacy to blockchains uh, via a layer one, uh, a coin that's called Zcash. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't really that much capacity to deal with other things and also new technology. The technology of Starks is, is more advanced and it works differently. It doesn't need a trusted setup and it, it's more efficient. So, so, you know, Zcash as an entity couldn't quite uh, tackle this challenge. So um, I had, so at the time, basically we sort of uh, grouped up together. We were four co-founders. Um, um, Uri Kolodny, who's the CEO, uh, a good friend of mine that has been, uh, you know, a serial entrepreneur for 30 years. Um, Mike, Dr. Michael Ryabtsev, who at the time was my PhD student and, and is a co-inventor of Starks, and um, uh, Professor Alessandro Chiesa, who was a, also a founding scientist of Zcash, and a professor of computer science at Berkeley. And he's also one of the pioneers of this sort of covering the theory and practice of cryptographic proofs, uh, Starks and Snarks and, and many other things in between. So the four of us uh, sort of thought that it, it is better to start a new endeavor that focuses first only on scalability, uh, which at the time wasn't viewed as a serious problem. This was uh, end of 2017, uh -huh. but now, you know, everyone's talking about scalability. Right. You, you foresaw the future. So this is great. Uh, what a story. I mean, I just like, I'm so, I'm so impressed, like how I'm hearing all these like big names and I've been doing some research on, you know, academia side of um, how blockchain like uh, in academia was created in that community. And so I just like, I'm, I'm so happy to hear these names. Um, yeah, and let's now, yeah, <laughs> of course. And one of the main slogans of Star Wars, when I saw the website, it was just like right there, is to bring scalability and privacy to a blockchain near you. And, you know, what does this mean? And I guess like near you means like it's very, uh, it can be very accessible, uh, but how can we achieve both um, at the same time? I mean, we're gonna go into the uh, concepts, but then like, can you just kind of generally explain how we can achieve both? Yeah, so the, the, the slogan that might change someday, but you know, bringing <laughs> scalability and privacy to a blockchain near you, so let's go over it. First of all, it means, um, you know, Starkware famously does not have a token and there's no specific blockchain that we are maximalists of. We believe that this uh, core technology called Starks 
um, will go on all blockchains. It will mm -hmm. go, it, it is inevitable that it will appear on Bitcoin and on Ethereum and on, you know, Tezos and Zcash and Filecoin and you name it. Uh, they all need the the attributes um, and, 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 you know, the amazing properties of these things called zero knowledge Starks. Mm -hmm. um, so the first place we deployed on, uh, because it's where scalability is most needed currently, um, and where we can actually deploy it is Ethereum, but it's certainly not the end point. We have conversations all the time with other blockchains. Uh, we believe it will also be deployed elsewhere. Um, now, the mission or the vision that we have is that there's this uh, very powerful technology that we'll discuss in a minute. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really, really is very well fit for blockchains because it offers the security and assured integrity that is, you know, one of the core principles of blockchains, of decentralized public blockchains that don't put trust in any, you know, uh, party or authority. Mm -hmm. And Starks have the highest grade of uh, uh, security and trust assumptions. And at the same time, it is extremely um, powerful in its ability to really scale the number of transactions or to exponentially reduce, you know, the gas cost or the cost, um, you know, on the network for verifying integrity of large computations. And at the same time, it also preserves privacy and uh, allows for the fungibility, uh, just like you have with our previous technology deployed on Zcash. So you can have both the privacy that you have already on Zcash with this earlier technology and the scalability uh, for processing, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of transactions uh, per second um, that you need for blockchains to conquer the world. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's a grand, that's a grand vision. And let's go down, you know, and break down this powerful technology that you just mentioned, right? Um, <laughs> let's break down the main concepts surrounding Starkware technology and platform that you're building. A lot of people find it difficult to understand uh, the concepts, and I, you know, I know it's very difficult to explain simple terms. But you know, could you just explain um, zk Starks uh, to me as if you know I were you know a middle school student, <laughs> and how would it be deep, different? From from DK Snarks. Uh, could you explain that, please? Okay, so let's first start with what, what do we mean by ZK Starks? And first of all, um, I want to say that they are part of this big, big family of uh, cryptographic proofs, sometimes referred to as interactive proofs, and, and there are many, many names. But so what do they uh, afford you? Um, so I think that the best uh, starting point for someone who would be in middle school you know, if I tried to explain this to my kids, would be to think of uh, one of those sort of uh, um, grocery receipts or restaurant receipts that you would receive in the pre-computer days, right? Mm -hmm. So the grocer or the restaurant, you know, the waiter would sort of write on a piece of paper a bunch of, um, you know, numbers for the different items that you consumed or bought. And then there would be some summation and you are given this piece of paper. Now, this is a proof. It, mm -hmm. it, it is produced in order for you to be able to, you know, check and verify by naively recomputing the summation operation and checking that the total sum you're going to pay is the right sum. Mm -hmm. So what you have there in this receipt is a proof, a proof that uh, the computation of summing up a bunch of uh, numbers resulted in whatever, uh, $20 that you have to pay. Okay, so this is a proof. It's an amazing form of proof, and it's been around for millennia, right? You, in archaeological, uh, you know, sites, you can find, uh, you know, very old forms of this uh, way of computation and proving that something is correct. Mm -hmm. Now, what this proof gives you is uh, integrity or computational integrity. It basically convinces you that a certain computation was done with integrity. It was done correctly. You know, no one slipped in something that shouldn't have appeared. So what you get is some assurance of computational integrity. Now, what proofs really are about are about guaranteeing you computational integrity. So the difference between the grocery receipt and a ZK Stark, um, there are two, well, there are several main differences. Let's go over them. Um, ZK is the zero knowledge aspect. So with, when you get your grocery receipt, you basically see all of the information needed in order to do the computation. Um, a ZK proof 
can assure you of computational integrity. So it convinces you that the total sum is correct. Mm -hmm. But you can think of the you know, individual items that went as being blinded out. And you can still know that the computation was correct, even without seeing mm -hmm. the parts that went into it, which is kind of mind boggling. And even if the grocer in this uh, proverbial example wants to you know, cheat you and get more money from you, you would still know that the answer is correct. So that's the zero knowledge aspect. And this is what delivers privacy. Another aspect, which is even more amazing is that um, you know, in the grocery receipt, the amount of time it takes you to check the computation to verify the proof is exactly the same time it would take for the grocer to compute it you know, uh -huh. by, by himself. Scalability means that the proof can be exponentially smaller than the amount of computation. And this is absolutely mind boggling. So you can have a, a proof that is, uh, you know, 100 kilobytes long that would convince you that all of the transactions on Bitcoin were done correctly from the Genesis block till today. And even without knowing anything or assuming almost anything about the way Bitcoin operates, you could still verify that the current state is correct by inspecting a very short proof. So there's this aspect of scalability, which is also very amazing and surprising. Um, and the third aspect that I want to talk about, uh, you know, in Starks is that this can be applied to any computer program, what we call universality or queuing completeness. It is not something that you can apply only to summing up items in a restaurant. It can be done to any arbitrary computation as long as you can specify it through some computer program. So these three aspects, privacy, scalability, and universality, which means you can do it for any computation, are three very important things uh, that, that are delivered by ZK Starks. Mm -hmm. Now, to your question about ZK Snarks, um, they are very similar. And of course, the name sort of uh, sh hints at this similarity. Um, with mathematical definitions, often it is a question of what aspects do you want to emphasize? So a Stark, you know, the big difference between a Stark and a Snark is T versus N, right? The second letter. <laughs> yes. um, and, and there are other smaller things, but Starks demand that there be no trusted setup and no toxic waste and no keys needed in order to verify the correctness of a proof. And uh, this is very important for scalability and for trusting, you know, if you want someday a central government to generate uh, a proof that it is behaving with integrity, it's very important that there are no keys that you have to trust the government with generating. In a snark, you can have this trusted setup or toxic waste. And indeed, for instance, in Zcash, you know, uh, unfortunately, we did have to have this, uh, you know, these keys. And, and you know, the, there's a lot of research going on in Snark world on, on removing that key. But, uh, you know, this is already something that we achieved with Starks. Um, the N in a Snark demands that the proof be what we call non-interactive. So it's sort of a one-shot proof. And um, Starks uh, allow more interaction which is again, another benefit. You can use actually the blockchain to get some randomness, you get better security and uh, you know, smaller proofs. So anyways, that's basically the difference, but they both deliver, they can deliver privacy and some notion of scalability and work for general computation. Wow, thank you so much for summarizing that. I mean, there are other concepts like ZK rollups and you know yes. optimistic rollups and uh, can you yes. also define those two as well and uh, zk rollups mainly but what problem is it trying to solve and you know how are those two different yeah so so that's a terrific question that's uh, very uh you know very much you know uh, debated today so first of all like here's a sort of a, something a bit baffling and you know somewhat of a paradox um bitcoin was rolled out in 2008. Ethereum was rolled out, I think in 2015 or so. So these are very young technologies. And yet the amount of transactions they can process is extremely small, right? Mm -hmm. 
around 10 transactions per second, whereas Visa processes, you know, thousands of transactions per second. And that's based on technology from the 1970s or 60s. And, uh, you know, Alipay and WeChat Pay, they process hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. So now you can ask yourself, why is it that, that blockchains are so slow, even though the technology is so young and should have been much faster? Right. And the answer to that is this beautiful principle that is very democratic and very, you know, very um, inspiring that I call uh, inclusive accountability, which means you want anyone with a laptop to be able to connect to the network and participate in verifying the integrity of all of the system. Mm -hmm. So you want to put a very strong limit on the amount of computation going on in the network so that everyone can verify that everything is correct. And you don't need to rely on accountants or central bankers or someone who could shut the system down. Okay, so if you want inclusive accountability, if you want to allow everyone to track everything that's going on, you're gonna have to suffer in terms of scalability. Mm -hmm. So now we have this big problem Everyone wants to, you know, mint their NFTs and play games on blockchains and transact, but they have very little space and they have very little space and bandwidth because you want to preserve this beautiful property of inclusive accountability. So now we have, we have this big, big scaling problem. So what can you do? Okay, well, one thing you could do is go back to the old system that says, let's just trust someone. Um, could be a banker, could be Binance, could be some, you know, someone else. We say, you know, that's, you know, we trust them. They're going to, we're going to put all their fun, our, all our funds there. And basically we're going to transact off chain. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to do it. And it's certainly, as long as the trust assumptions hold, it certainly is very efficient. But many people say, wait a second, the whole reason we moved from the conventional world to blockchains is in order to operate under inclusive accountability and not have this you know, ability for anyone to censor us, right? So we don't want to place our funds with, uh, you know, CZ or with 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 anyone, even, even though we have tremendous respect for them, okay? We want the blockchain. Okay, so now what can you do? So rollups basically say, wait a second, let us use the blockchains only for recording the raw data that is needed in order to reconstruct what happened, but then do all of the computation and storage off-chain. And this will somewhat help alleviating the, you know, this uh, bottleneck that we currently have. It doesn't go all the way. You know, there are mechanisms like sharding that Ethereum 2.0 is going to give. And Starkware has its own solution right now that we call Validium that basically even takes the data off chain and, you know, gets even bigger scalability. But anyways, let's focus on rollups. So in rollups, people say, let us put only the raw data um, and as, as little of it as, as, as we can in order for everyone to be able to track the state of the system, but then do a lot of the stuff off chain. So that's the concept of a rollup. And then there are two different uh, competing ways that you can do a rollup. One mm -hmm. is optimistic rollup, which is based on fraud proofs, which means um, the, the main chain with its inclusive accountability doesn't really know what's going on uh, on this L2, on this layer two, it doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And in a fraud proof based system, we allow anyone to update the system to any state they want optimistically. That's why it's called optimistic rollups. But then, you know, someone might move the state of a system to a state where, you know, all of the funds are in my account. And, you know, even though no one paid me them. So in order to prevent this, and actually I could do this. So, you know, when optimistic rollups go out there, if there's a funds locked on there, I could submit to the main chain an update that basically takes all of those funds and puts them in my account. I could submit it. It will be accepted at least temporarily as the new state of the system. That's of course bad. So in optimistic rollups, there's this window of reconciliation and you know anyone can sort of raise a flag, say, wait a second, there is a problem here. Someone is trying to steal the funds. And then there's a period, uh, a, a time window that, that roughly is one week, but you know no one actually properly analyzed it uh, during which you can have this dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. That's how optimistic rollups work. And this entails a very long time to, you can pull your funds out because you know who knows if uh, the state you're pulling out from is legitimate. ZK rollups 
use the power of uh, ZK proofs, in our case, it's ZK Starks, in a way that, I mean, with proofs, you can't move the system to any invalid state uh, and generate a proof for it. So you can only move your state to a new, uh, uh, to a new state that is valid. So with ZK rollups, what you do is the state can be changed on the main layer, uh, L1 on, on Ethereum, only if it is appended with a proof that shows, a start proof that shows that's correct. So in a start based ZK rollup, what will happen is every time there's a state transition, you need to offer a proof for it. But once the proof is verified immediately in blockchain time, you can know that this is a valid state and then people can you know, go in and out from it and uh, it's much faster. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between ZK rollups and optimistic rollups. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, thanks for, I mean, I could understand it definitely. It's, it's so much clearer now. And, you know, how, how does, I mean, what does Starkware like really concentrate on building in? You know, you, we're going to introduce like a lot of the, you know, amazing things that you have built um, so far, but like, how do these interplay with each other? Um, and yeah, just, uh, can you just kind of explain, like go through like what actually what technology is put to use like where and how and kind of uh, that flow maybe could, could you explain that yeah so yeah so currently we have um we have several products um that are already deployed on mainnet and all of them work either in roll-up mode which means that you have the raw data on chain and then there are proofs generated off chain mm -hmm. or in validium mode which means that you only keep the uh, you know, the hash of the current state of the system on chain, and you update that. So the first system we deployed is called Stark X. Mm -hmm. It is a scaling engine for um, trading. Um, first, we deployed it with Diversify, uh, which is um, the decentralized version of Bitfinex. And um, we do that for transfers and for uh, spot trading and, uh, and swapping. Um, and that's been deployed for the past half, uh, half year. Uh, the second system that just went live uh, a couple of weeks ago and still is in alpha mode is DYDX. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that Antonio, um, you know, our partner and you know, the founder of DYDX was on your show. Yes. I listened to it. It was a great show. <laughs> Thank um, you. So uh, they have also serious scaling issues, right? And um, they put their perpetual contracts, which is some form of margin trading, mm -hmm. um, on StarKicks. And the third system, you know, everyone's talking about NFTs today and the cost of uh, uh, minting them and moving them. So the third system that will go live in a small number of weeks is with Immutable. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Immutable X. Immutable is the company from Australia uh, that is behind the Gods Unchained, mm -hmm. um, a popular game. Yes, <laughs> and um, this system will will deal with trading and minting of non fungible tokens of NFTs. So currently, those are three systems under the Starkix offering. And the way the system works is that we have off chain this big state that has all the accounts and you know trades and whatnot. And once in a while, we generate this Stark proof of an update to the state of the system, and we post the proof and the update to the state of the system on to L1. On L1, there's a verifier. The verifier inspects the proof. If the proof is okay, then the verifier knows that the state can be updated safely. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that you reduce a lot of gas cost because transactions aren't processed on layer one and the users don't have to pay gas costs for their transactions. There's only this one proof that is very, very small and it sort of covers um, you know, thousands of transactions or, you know, hundreds of thousands of mintings of NFTs. Um, and, and that's how we reach scalability. Oh, so with DYDX, Diversify and Immutable X, so you, you're all helping them with StarkX. And, um, you know, since they're using the same solution, can we assume that they're, you know, uh, I mean, they're kind of having the same mechanism, well, not same, but similar mechanism in general, like, can we assume that or is it totally different? you can more than assume that this is precisely as you said it they are all using the very same system that we're constantly adding more functionality to it so for instance if someone comes tomorrow and says you know what we would like a starkit system that allows both nft minting and trading and also you know spot trading 
we can sort of uh, uh, make that happen. And it's all based on the same architecture that has a programming language that we'll discuss called Cairo, in mm -hmm. which our uh, developers write uh, programs and anyone can write programs in it. And these programs, their executions are proved via start proofs um, by uh, you know, some shared proving mechanism that basically can bundle together many proofs for many different systems and place this one proof that covers all of these different executions on chain in one batch. So yeah, uh, Diversify, um, Immutable X, um, DYDX, and all the other customers that are, we're talking to now, and you know, some of them will announce hopefully in the near future, all of them operate on the same framework um, using the same uh, architecture. Oh, very interesting. And you mentioned about Cairo, so we're gonna jump right ahead. And when we look at the Start for official website, which I recommend you all do because it's very informative, the first thing that you see is hello Cairo. Um, is it the city Cairo? Am I or <laughs> does it stand for something else? Well, there is a city Cairo. Uh, so <laughs> so you know we we reside in Israel. Uh, Egypt is our neighbor, um, and Cairo is a very famous city. Yeah. Um, uh, Cairo actually stands for it's an acronym um, that stands for the letter C comes from CPU. Uh, you know, CPU, uh, computer yes. chip. And then the next three letters are AIR, which are an algebraic term that comes from the math of, of Starks. It means algebraic intermediate representation. Um. If you take C and AIR, you get chi rho. And the O is there, you know, for, <laughs> for beauty. Oh, yeah. oh. I like that. I like that a lot. Ah, Cairo. And okay, so we're going to break down Cairo as well. So you mentioned that it is a start friendly programming language, but um, can you kind of break that down as well in just uh, simple terms, um, how, what it is and who can use it and so forth? Yeah, so I'll start with the second part. Who can use it? Everyone can use it. If you go to <laughs> cairo-lang.org, Mm -hmm. You can start programming and there's a playground and you can run some programs so anyone can use it. But now let's let's explain a little bit what it is. Now, uh, you probably heard that there are many, many, um, you know, ZKPs out there. Um, there are Snarks and there's Zcash and there's Bulletproofs and there's uh, Halo and Plonks and Slonks and, and like this <sighs> huge Cambrian explosion of, of uh, proof systems and technologies. And you look at that and you say, wow, you know, I want to use this stuff. Mm -hmm. And till Cairo, uh, if you said, I want to use this stuff and I want to write something, you know, I, I have a computation in mind that I want to scale. I want to do something. Okay, let's start using it. Well, that was a problem, uh, especially if you wanted that sort of, you know, put on a blockchain or use for something because you would have to sort of learn the material for a very long period of time. And uh, the tooling that came around was, was very um, hard to use. And, and especially if you want to build a product around it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what Cairo does, so Cairo is, is a number of things, but I mean, there's a programming language called Cairo, but there's this big framework and tool chain that, that also goes by the name Cairo. And mm -hmm. the sort of the TLDR of it is it allows developers to write code in a very pleasant and you know uh, language that, that that is not hard to learn. In particular, you don't need to learn all of the moon math that you would need in order to build the system behind it. So it's very accessible. You can write programs, and then you can literally press a button, and the execution of those programs would have a start proof automatically generated for them, placed on a blockchain and verified within the press of a button. So previously, for instance, when we built Zcash, so, you know, we understood the math and then, you know, the Zcash engineering team and scientists had to sit for a very long time and build these um, gadgets and R1CS constraint systems and work very, very hard to craft the computation that is behind Zcash. When Stark was started and we built the very first version of uh, Stark X for Diversify, our uh, engineers and scientists had to sit for a very long time and deal with these constraints and errors and, you know, like work with polynomials and variables it was very, very hard and, and also, you know, scary in terms of mm -hmm. safety. Mm -hmm. With Cairo, now our developers and actually 
any developer in the world can basically write code, you know, functions, loops, recursion, memory, um, and it gets compiled, it gets executed, proofs for it are generated automatically, bundled together with several other Cairo runs, and a single proof of all of the correctness is already placed on chain, and you can consume the results of this computation uh, from the blockchain. So, so uh-huh. Cairo sort of makes Starks extremely accessible to all developers. Then if that's the case, I mean, just a side question, but if that's, if you're providing that like a uh, very useful solution and language, um, uh, where would Starkware like come in? Like as a, like, uh, I mean, if you're like providing a really beneficial tool for everybody, then like uh, what else could Starkware provide like that is um, um, like, I guess, differentiated uh, from like, you know, uh, having that tool set. So what else could Starkware provide? Just, uh, just a curiosity. Okay, so some customers, they want... Uh, so right now, the tool chain that you get, and everyone can use it, is very... Um, is still, you know, it's a developer kit for writing programs, but you still need to work very hard for building a system, you know, like a database and a backend that maintains this off-chain state, updates it, synchronizes it with the blockchain, and so on. So many of our customers, all the existing ones, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Diversify, Immutable X... Um, um, the DYDX, uh, we partnered with them on also building uh, certain parts of the back end and operating them. So that's mm-hmm. one aspect that Starker uh, has expertise in. Another one is uh, running uh, big proving services. So the proving uh, um, apparatus is the most uh, complicated and computation intensive aspect. Mm-hmm. And uh, currently we run the provers. We're going to release um, under a license called Polaris that allows anyone to run provers. We're going to release provers for others to use. But another thing that Starkware uh, offers right now and hopefully will continue offering um, uh, very efficiently is proving services for anyone who wants um, to use them. And um, the third thing that, that uh, you know, we're going to be offering is basically just improved tooling for everyone to use. And in particular, one other product that is you know, now starting to shape up and, and we'll have a lot more to present on it in, in uh, a month or two is StarkNet. Mm-hmm. StarkNet, so currently like our products are you know, a dedicated system that is one L2 system that is, uh, you know, we sort of built and there's a backend and so on. With StarkNet, it's going to be this uh, L2 that anyone can treat as if it's an L1, meaning you can deploy uh, smart contracts on it in a permissionless way. You can send transactions to it in a permissionless way. Um, And it will sort of all, you know, there can be several different uh, smart contracts and they can all talk to one another and in a permissionless kind of way. So this whole system is um, going to be operating. Um, this is my daughter. Oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> it's totally uh, fine. So th- this whole system is going to be operating in uh, in in a sort of a decentralized way that everyone can deploy on. And that's another thing that we'll be offering later on. Um, you know, this year, actually, towards the summer. Oh wow! So I mean, like you mentioned, Starknet, and I I believe it can be compared to what Ethereum can do, but it does have other yes. updated and revised functions. And so, um, yes. thank you for explaining that and what what it can enable. Um, so I look forward to you know the upcoming months. It's it's going to be very exciting, yeah. right? But, <laughs> so from an outsider's perspective, it 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 does seem like so right now, like uh, there's a lot of talk about all these different, you know, roll-up solutions, and they're being all fragmented, and, you know, it it results in a difficulty, like, in interoperable, um, interoperability amongst, you know, dApps that use different L2 solutions, and there's a lot of uh, talk about this, and what are your thoughts relating to this concern? Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific question, and, and at Starkware, you know, many of our teammates have put uh, amazing work into thinking about this problem, And I think we have pretty good solutions for them. So let's go over the possibilities. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think will very likely happen is, you know, because StarkNet is going to allow multiple different um, uh, dApps to Mm -hmm. operate with one another. So as long as you're on this L2, 
uh, it's going to be very easy for you to get composability and interoperability. Just like on Ethereum, if you have different smart contracts, they sort of can talk seamlessly. Um, now, of course, if you want you know, a smart contract on Ethereum to talk to some smart contract on Tezos or something, that's a bigger problem, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So what you have for different L2s that reside in Ethereum that is slightly better than the case of two different and separate blockchains is you do have this channel of communication that is L1. So, you know, some L2 here could send some message through L1 to this other application. And, and, and then th that's another mode of operation that is definitely very easy to, to implement. And in fact, if you think about the current Stark systems that we have, uh, this is pretty much how they work. So like some operations happen, some operation happens on L2. Uh, you know, it gets reflected on L1. Now it lives on L1. You can take it anywhere you want. So if you mm -hmm. want to go into some other uh, L2, let's say Loop Ring, you know, you started with Diversify, you want to take your funds out, you want to move them to Loop Ring, you could do that through L1 easily at blockchain speed. Now, the third and most interesting aspect is, and, and the most challenging, but, but it's actually not that bad, is the case where uh, suppose you have two different L2s that are on the same, um, on the same network. So, especially with the case of ZK rollups, um, because you have this notion of, of uh, validity proofs, and if you know something, uh, you know, if you know that a proof exists, then there's sort of no, uh, no worry that, that uh, a state is invalid. So, you could have statements, um, sort of, you know, IOUs that are generated from one chain and are actually accepted by the other chain. Hello? Uh, oh, oh, oh. Hello? You there? Hi. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Think, uh, think... Yeah, you froze for me. Oh, sorry about that. Can you, sorry, but can you repeat that again? Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, do you want to repeat the question? Yeah, I'll do that. From the start? Yes, that'd be, I think that's better because, yeah, sorry about that. I don't know. Oh, yeah. no you just kind of like just but out so i think it's my problem um so i'll just repeat the entire question if, if that's okay yes yeah of course yeah <laughs> okay so from an outsider's perspective it seems like you know uh, roll up solutions are being fragmented and you know it thus results in a difficulty in interoperability among dApps that use different l2 solutions and you know uh, there's a lot of debate about this um what and concerns about it what is your thought relating to this concern Okay, so that's a terrific question, and, and uh, the folks at Starker have put a lot of thought into this uh, question of interoperability, um, you know, among different dApps. So there are uh, three possible, um, you know, mechanisms of interoperability, and let's go in increasing complexity. The simplest situation is when you have different dApps that operate on the same L2. And here, you know, on StarkNet, for instance, so which, which will allow multiple smart contracts. So here, actually, there's no problem. Just like if you have different smart contracts on Ethereum, they can uh, interoperate seamlessly. Same thing on the L2. So that's the simplest case. The second case, which also isn't that bad, is when you have two different L2s, you know, two instances of StarkNet, or maybe a StarkNet and some other net. And since both of them reside on L1, and you can sort of go in and out through L1, you can use L1 as a channel to send something, you know, uh, withdraw it from one point, move it over to some other place. Now, mm -hmm. with ZK rollups, uh, such as StarkNet, it's going to be extremely efficient because anyways, your finality is instant. So you want to withdraw your funds, you can sort of uh, take them out, get them on blo in blockchain speed, move them to some other L2, work there. Um, that's the second mechanism. And there are even faster ways uh, called uh, fast withdrawals. And, and, you know, we have blogs explaining, uh, blog posts explaining that. Mm -hmm. The third and most challenging and interesting case is when you have two different um, L2s and uh, they don't even want to communicate through L1. And here you can have these IOUs that are recognized in one chain that relate to the other. So as long as someone signs, uh, you know, on this L2 and you trust the operator of that L2 to eventually, you know, to sort of say on the L2, yes, I'm going to take this uh, transaction and I'm going to put it on chain soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and you trust that, right? So you can go already and operate on an L2 in, in assuming that. 
Um, and of course, there's there's some risk that this L2 sort of you know gets a reorg or something. But uh, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen often. And so you can even have L2 to L2 interoperability and re later reconciliation without going through L1. And this is a little bit like the you know the way that a lot of uh, conventional markets work, where you you know you sign a deal, and then there's like T plus three for settlement, and <laughs> things get uh, reorged later on. So you can have the same thing with different L2s. Uh huh. So um, are you saying that like so is there a way for L2 solutions to collaborate together, or is it like just pure competition? Like right now, it just seems like for just a you know from my perspective or from uh, the community's perspective, it just seems like a competition. But do you do you think that we can they can all collaborate together? Yeah, I don't view it as a competition at all. I what I view it is that we're just in the early days, so each team is hunkering down and getting something out. Right? <laughs> yes. Um, so we are, you know, I'm constantly saying that you know we'd love to have L two to L two interoperability with any meaningful L two. Uh, currently, there aren't that many. Um, you know, we I know that. Uh, um, um, Loopring, which is another L2, have said that they want interoperability. That's another, you know, notable L2. Uh, we're, of course, happy with that. We'd love to collaborate with them. Um, I think they even went further as to say that they would like to, uh, they're contemplated, contemplating at some point to sort of um, rely on some other form of technology for their ZK proofs. And, of course, you know, we'd love to be that uh, layer of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we'd also love to have interoperability with other chains and also with, uh, you know, ZK rollups and things like that. Once they, they exist and there's meaningful traffic on it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And on the other side, I just want to say that I, I know that a lot of ZK rollups, sorry, a lot of optimistic rollups have mm -hmm. said, I think, I'm not sure if it was Arbitrum or I'm not sure who said that, you know, they plan sooner in the future to incorporate into the optimistic rollup ZK proofs and ZK rollups, which I think is a great idea because I think it's a, you know, the, the way to go with rollups is actually to use validity proofs and not rely only on fraud proofs. So I think uh, we'll see a lot of merging of technologies uh, later on and adoption of, uh, you know, technologies that work best. Yeah, I think it's like an interesting phase in, in the blockchain space where you just see like a variety of different, you know, uh, competitors uh, that are providing similar services. But then in the end, I think, as you mentioned, you we either, you know, can kind of merge or acquire or, or I don't know, just help each other <laughs> and it just become a more, I guess, a solid structure in the end. So I, I agree with you that it is just a phase, but uh, it's very interesting to be a part of it and just oversee like what, what is going on right now. So very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you could you share like some upcoming milestones for Starkware? I mean, a lot of things are going on for right now, but is there anything that you would like to share that is uh, coming very soon? Yeah. So, uh, OK, the most immediate thing that is already accessible is uh, uh, the Cairo uh, framework that is mm -hmm. accessible now. So anyone listening to this show, especially if you're a developer and you want to, you know, get ahead of the curve and, um, you know, just like Right, those who jumped on the Ethereum Solidity uh, wagon <laughs> early on were very happy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just yesterday, um, Nethermind announced that they are building, forming a three-man dedicated team to learn uh, Cairo and start oh. building on Cairo and for Starknet. So mm -hmm. I think the most immediate thing for developers to do is basically jump on this wagon, start uh, learning Cairo and building applications on it and preparing for Starknet. That's the most pressing thing that I can offer the world of developers. Um, shortly within, uh, I'm not sure when this episode is going to be airing, but maybe by the time it airs, uh, you know, within a very short time, um, DYDX is going to go uh, live, uh, uh, not in alpha mode, allowing uh -huh. everyone to trade on it. Uh -huh. And Immutable X is going to go live, allowing uh, people to trade and mint, uh, you know, multiple NFTs at very low costs, gas costs. Um, those are other things. Um, we announced that we're collaborating with BadgerDAO on having uh, DeFi pooling and basically, uh, you know, reducing cash costs for things like AMMs. Um, mm. So we're partnering with them. Uh, mm. That should be in a small number of months as well. Um, further down the line, you know, 
by summer, maybe a little bit before that, we'll release um, some, some version already of StarkNet, which will allow um, basically people to deploy smart contracts onto them, um, submit transactions, and you'll have this sort of uh, Ethereum-like uh, L2 um, that, mm -hmm. that uses uh, ZK rollups. Those are the main milestones uh, for the next uh, half year. Wow. Wow, that's so interesting. And, you know, I, I I just saw the new sign on your website on the Cairo. So I just assumed like this is super new. <laughs> because it just had like a new yes. flat, yeah, blazing. Um, so I really suggest a lot of developers, especially in Asia who, you know, who are watching the show, uh, I would really highly recommend that, you know, they check it out. Um, is Starkware looking to expand, well, to kind of uh, make a more, uh, more exposure into the Asian markets? And if so, like, how do you, plan to move forward okay so this is a um you know <laughs> this is a sore point for us i mean i you know i take responsibility for we would love to collaborate more with uh teams in asia mm -hmm. i mean you know starker sits in israel israel formally is a part of asia mm -hmm. um so but but of course <laughs> you know, uh, culturally uh we're not uh, you know, uh I think it's more affiliated with Europe, uh -huh. um, and um, that's regrettable from our point of view. We would love to collaborate more um, with uh, teams in Asia, and um, that's definitely something we want to improve. Now, when I say collaborate with, I think the point of collaboration that would be easiest uh -huh. for us uh, by the nature of our company as being a technology provider and an infrastructure provider. so. There's a lot of demand for scalability also in Asian markets, right? I mean, right. you know, this is obvious. Most of the action is going on anyways in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's a lot of demand from exchanges and, and you know, NFT producers and so on. We would love to uh, partner with uh, any of these parties that is facing scalability problems and, and uh, see if we can, you know, service them or collaborate with them um, using uh, the technology that we already have. And uh, as, as you mentioned, with regards to Cairo, um, any independent teams that just want to start building on it, you know, as you know, preparing for uh, StarkNet, we, we have, uh, you know, full intention to support this in every way that we can, uh, that we can do it. Yeah, so definitely we'd love to uh, improve our exposure and our collaboration with uh, uh, meaningful teams in, in Asia. Yeah, I think it'd be great to have like a like a like a teach te like teach Cairo session or something. I don't know, just to for um, uh, newbies, uh, newbie developers or even student developers who who have. I mean, and there's increasing you know uh, interest in a lot of the blockchain technology out there in Asia, not just like in trading. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of potential uh, for collaboration. And um, I mean, since the I think the market's prepared and you guys are prepared, so I think it's just the perfect mix, right? <laughs> There's a huge demand yeah, for it. Yeah, in this respect. <laughs> yeah, in this respect, uh, I, I'm guessing that by the time this episode airs, it may be too late, but we'll have recordings. Um, but but this coming Sunday and Monday, so March 14 and 15, mm -hmm. um, we are doing a uh, Cairo developer workshop mm -hmm. um, called Cairo 101, and it's open for anyone to register to. So mm -hmm. maybe after, because I, I I suspect that this show may be aired later than that. But maybe uh, I'll just uh, send you a link, and if you can spread the word, and uh, you know, through your channels, anyone wants to join, that would be terrific. Okay, well, I will do that, and I think hopefully I can get it before uh, it happens. But if not, then I will uh, put a primer, you know, previous uh, post on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a very I think it's a good beginning and I think a lot of Asian developers should be involved and um, yeah, I'll try my best to, you know, share the word. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for, you know, um, enlightening me with all this, you know, um, amazing technology that you're building. And um, I was a big fan of Startword from the get go. So I'm just uh, very happy to have you. And you. Uh, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing you again in person, you know, uh, in the upcoming, yes. upcoming year. And uh, good luck to the rest of your milestones um, in Startware. <laughs> Thank you very much, Erica. Thanks for having me on this show. Thanks for, you know, uh, advancing and pioneering uh, the, the adoption of blockchains and uh, 
South Korea, now in Vietnam. And yeah, I, I really hope to be, you know, for this whole COVID situation to sort of uh, disappear mm. and be able to travel again. And uh, definitely we want, as, as we said, our also physical presence to be in uh, um, one of your events. Yeah, I will definitely invite you and your team over. So stay tuned for that. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a have a great day. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.